Good morning. It is so wonderful to see you all this morning on this beautiful Easter Sunday. And I want to welcome you. If you're guests with us this morning, uh, on behalf of the whole church, I welcome you and we are so glad that you are worshiping with us today. I ask you to take a moment and to find the registration folder, the attendance registration folder. It looks like this. And it'll be someplace on the row where you're sitting. And if you would please fill that out, pass it down the row, and then let it make its way back. And you're welcome, of course, to see who you're sitting with and to let it be an opportunity to meet a new friend, uh, learn a new name, make a friend in Christ. And also you'll find a card that says how to join on the front of the card. If you desire to become a member of this community of faith by profession of your faith in Christ or by transfer of your membership from another congregation, then please fill this out and bring it with you during the singing of the last hymn. And we will, with great joy, welcome you here at the front as new members of our community of faith. And finally, on the far right-hand side of your worship guide is a little tear-off section, and it contains a little bit of information about many of the ministry areas in our church. And please take that with you, either for your own information or, if you would like, pass it on to someone else when you invite them to be a part of our community of faith. And now will you please stand as we sing together hymn number 302.
standing for our call to worship. Christ is risen. 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 of Easter as we stand and say our affirmation of faith. We believe in the God of Easter who transforms darkness into light, hatred into love, and despair into hope. We believe God is always working for good, transforming every Good Friday experience of brokenness into our Easter of new life and new hope. We believe in the risen Christ, 
whose life and teachings we follow, whose death and resurrection shows us the way of salvation, who calls us by name to be his disciples, the body of Christ in this world. We believe in the Holy Spirit as the divine presence in our lives, constantly reminding us and empowering us in the truth of Christ at all times and in all places. We believe that our faith should be practiced in loving service to others as Christ demonstrated in his own life to the end that the God's kingdom may come upon the earth. Amen. Please be seated. We have traveled together during this journey in Lent, acknowledging our brokenness and the brokenness that exists in our world, and then being reminded of God's power to heal the brokenness and transform it into wholeness, just as God transformed Jesus' own brokenness on the cross and brought him to fullness of life on Easter Sunday. The first demonstration of the kind of transformation we are all invited to accept into our own lives. As we remember that our brokenness is made whole through love, we can commit ourselves to live out that love, not just as we have in the past, not someday when things get better or we have more time, but now, now, because now is all we have to give. Let us pray. God of abiding love and grace, we give to you our gifts and our tithes, that we would begin to live out your love even now. In the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, amen.
New Testament lesson reading today is from Colossians chapter 3. Therefore, if you were raised with Christ, look for the things that are above where Christ is sitting at God's right side. Think about the things above and not things on earth. You died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Therefore, as God's choice, holy and loved, put on companionship, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, Be tolerant with each other, and if anyone has a complaint against anyone, forgive each other, as the Lord forgave you. So also forgive each other. And all over these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. The peace of Christ must control your hearts, a peace into which you are called into one body. And be thankful, people. The word of Christ must live in you richly. Teach and warn each other with all wisdom and singing of the psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Whatever you do, whether in speech or action, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus and give thanks to God the Father through him. God speaks to us through the reading of scripture. Well, again, it's wonderful to see you all this morning and to be in worship together on this beautiful Easter morning. As I look out at uh, the congregation, I see new ties and new dresses. I know when our three daughters were growing up, they always loved Easter time because they got new Easter dresses. And uh, from the time they were toddlers... That was a wonderful day for them, getting new Easter dresses. My experience, however, as a small boy was quite different. It meant uh, taking a trip downtown, downtown Carthage, Texas. Everyone chuckles at that. I don't know. I mean, it's, <laughs> it, it's, it's not a major mo- metropolitan area, but it had a downtown. And back then, that's where the retail was. And there was a store called M&M Toggery. M&M Toggery. Don and Julia Martin were the owners of the store. And we would go before Easter every year, and I would get new shoes. Now, the Martins were wonderful people. Julia Martin, I remember, would always call me doll. And she would squeeze my cheek. She just couldn't resist it. Not part of, not my favorite part of going there. And then I would have to get new shoes. They were Buster Brown shoes. And um, you could get this little, at Easter time at least, you got this little egg, Buster Brown egg that had little prizes and stuff in it. That wasn't bad. That wasn't bad. But the new shoes were always stiff and tight and uncomfortable and they rubbed my feet in the wrong way. And I'd have to get a new shirt. And I don't know if this is still true. Back then in little boys shirts they used a chemical that made them itch and made them very stiff and uh, so you know I hated that and I had to put on the tie and, and all that kind of thing so getting new clothes for Easter was not a big thrill for me and I thought about all that all those memories came back to me when I heard about a little boy who was on his way to church with his parents one Easter Sunday and he was not happy it was a beautiful Easter day like today He wanted to be outside playing, and so he's wearing his tight shoes that are that are pinching his feet and and his tie and all of this itchy stuff. And he's sitting in the back seat and he's grumbling to himself. And his parents hear him say, "I don't know why we have to go to church anyway every Easter. They always tell the same old story, and it always ends the same way." Well, I think that little boy someday will grow up and he'll come to understand that the story is the same, but his story is different every year. And the story is forthright that 
we find in the scriptures with where it tells of all the brokenness on the part of the disciples and and of their failures and their struggles. And as he grows up, he will learn that he has brokenness and failures and struggles in his own life. And somehow the story that seems always the same somehow takes on a little different meaning because his story and the story found in the Gospels begin to intermingle and intertwine in different ways every year. And besides that, the ending is not always the same because he's a different person, you see. When we read through the pages of Scripture, we find that the earliest disciples told with unflinching reality what happened in their lives. What happened to Jesus during that last week? The struggles that they had. They told the truth about themselves. That they often bickered about who was greatest among them. Uh, They talked about their own betrayal and denial of Jesus. And how when he was crucified they scattered like sheep without a shepherd. And they locked themselves behind locked doors because they were afraid they tell all of those stories of brokenness. You can imagine they repeated them over and over again, remembered every detail as they recounted those painful memories. And eventually, they were written down so that we would hear those stories as well. You know, memories are created in us by emotional impact. You know, the the more emotional impact some event has for us, the more that memory is burned into our minds, for good or bad, whether it's a great memory or a painful and difficult one. And we find all of those in the gospel. And you can imagine that for them, when they heard certain sounds or smelled certain smells or heard certain words or saw certain images, that all of those memories came flooding back because that's what it means to be human and we're the same way. There are sounds that you could hear right now that will bring back a memory for you completely out of the blue or a word that I might speak. Or you might smell the scent of a certain flower or a certain cologne or the smell of a campfire. Whatever it is, the memories will come flooding back in. Well, we come today with those sorts of memories in our own hearts and lives, the ones that are really kind of burned into our minds, and some of them are painful. Some of them are memories of brokenness, experiences that we've had that are difficult, that are those memories that are made because of the emotional impact that is still difficult to take. We can learn from the disciples that we need to face our brokenness and those stories and not try to hide them or press them down but recognize they're part of who we are. Throughout this season of Lent, we've been looking at brokenness. And we began on Ash Wednesday with pouring out shards of broken glass and naming our brokenness. Reverend Linda McDermott poured out the glass at that service. And as she did, she named ways in which members of this congregation who were asked to submit examples of their own brokenness in their lives, how the things that they said that, that were brokenness for them, for us, a broken relationship, an ended marriage, a terrible illness, the death of a loved one, the loss of a job, all sorts of ways in which we experience brokenness in our lives and those shards of broken glass were poured out at that service. Brokenness. 
So what do we do with that? Well, we come seeking to hear again the story. The story that always ends in resurrection. The story that always points to newness of life and a new beginning. Philip Yancey, who is a wonderful writer, a pastor, tells the story of losing in quick succession three close friends of his. He spoke at the memorial services of all three. He said after he had suffered through the loss of those first two friends, he had running through his mind over and over again as he visited with the family, as he conducted those memorial services, that terrible, heavy word, irreversible. Irreversible. Final. No way to change it. Nothing to be done. Irreversible. He said that on the very day that his third friend, Bob, died in a scuba diving accident, before he had gotten the word, he was sitting in a cafe near the University of Chicago reading a book by Rollo May called My Search for Beauty. He was reading about May's search for things and places beautiful, and he read the section just about the time that his friend died of May's visit to a beautiful Greek Orthodox monastery in the Greek islands. It was the Greek Orthodox Easter service, a service that lasts all night long. And he said it was just glorious with all the sights and the smells and the sounds of of celebration. Because as the dawn was breaking, as night gave way to to daytime, the priest handed out eggs, beautifully decorated to the congregation. And then the priest said, in those ancient words we said a moment ago, Christ is risen. And they shouted back, He is risen indeed. And May recounted how at that moment he thought, Wow. What if that's true? What a different world we would have. What different lives we would have if he is risen. Philip Yancey said that suddenly that word irreversible that had been at the forefront of his mind began to have a competitor for his attention. Resurrection. He soon, later that day, received word about his third friend, Bob. And as he went to do that memorial service, he had this word resurrection at the forefront. And he kept saying to himself, it's not irreversible. It's reversible. And death does not have the last word. Life does. God does. I've thought about that all week. There's something a little bit off about that, it seems to me. Because the very thing that we yearn for in our brokenness is for it to be reversible. In other words, for things to go back to the way they were. That's what reversible means to me. I can imagine that those earliest disciples, after they had experienced the cruelty with which Jesus was treated, his arrest, his scourging, his crucifixion, his death, his entombment, I can imagine that they wanted nothing more than for things to be the way they were. To go back to an earlier time. To go back to the times when they were traveling around Galilee and hearing him teach and watching him do marvelous and remarkable things and learning at his feet and being inspired by this vision of the kingdom of God. 
Don't you know that they wanted reversibility? They wanted things to be like they were, but they would never be like they were. Death is indeed irreversible. But they would be new and alive and different. That's the meaning of resurrection is not reversibility. Jesus was resurrected, not resuscitated. There's a big difference. Resuscitation means that you just go back to the way things were. But that's not the experience. The experience is resurrection. And the gospel writers and the apostle Paul and all of them struggle to try to describe what that's like, this resurrection body. It still bears the scars. It bears the marks of brokenness. But it's something entirely new. There's a physicality to it in a way, but also he can appear and he can move through solid walls. It's hard to explain this mystery called resurrection. But it's not resuscitation. It's not a return to what was. It is rather a new creation, something new, something different, where there is a new hope and a new life and a new beginning. That's resurrection. And so the ending of the story, the one that the little boy said is always the same, ends with newness of life. In Christ we are new creations, Paul says. The writer of Colossians in our text for today speaks of dying with Christ, suffering as Christ suffers, but also being raised with Christ. The Apostle Paul in the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, that chapter, by the way, where he says, well, there is a spirit, there's a physical body, we all know that, but there's also a spiritual body. And, and it's like a seed, Paul says. You, you sow a seed of wheat or perhaps some other grain, and, but, but, it, but what you get is different. It's raised something other than that. It's sown a physical body. Paul struggles for the words to describe it, and he says, and it's raised a spiritual body, a new life, a new beginning, a new start. And he goes on to say that Christ is the first fruits of those who will be raised, meaning that we will follow in that resurrection. Made like him, like him we rise, Charles Wesley wrote in the hymn, we read a few minutes, or we sang a few moments ago. Made like him, like him we rise, ours, the cross, the grave, the skies. We participate, we are raised with Christ. And that's such a powerful message. It means that resurrection is not something just in the future sometime. We look forward to that hope. But resurrection is also something that takes place in our lives now. Gerard Manley Hopkins, a Jesuit poet, wrote a poem about the wreck of a ship called the Deutschland. It sank in 1875 in the Thames River. Five nuns were on board who lost their lives. And so he wrote this poem about that experience. And he had a really powerful poetic line in there that I want us to hear today and to take with us. He said, let him Easter in us. I love the way poets can take a word that we use all the time and use it in a different way. This noun Easter becomes in that poem a verb. Let him Easter in us. Let him Easter in us so that our brokenness doesn't mean that it all gets put back together as it was. It doesn't. But it means that our brokenness can be, we can be made whole, we can be made new, we can be new creations in Christ. We can have a new life, a new beginning out of our brokenness. What you see before you, this beautiful mosaic was made by members of our congregation on the Monday evenings during the season of Lent. It's made of broken glass. It's also made of sea glass, glass 
shards and glass chunks that have been churned in the water in the sea so that through that rough churning they have been made smooth. What what those shards were, what those broken pieces were, will not be again. That brokenness is irreversible. But what you see before you is a symbol of resurrection. There's something new. A new beginning. New creations. Let Him Easter in us so that our brokenness becomes wholeness. So that our brokenness gives way to something new. I don't know what your story is. I don't know what brokenness you bring with you today. I don't know how your story is different from what it was a year ago. For some of you, I do know some things about that. But whatever brokenness there is in it, know that Christ wants to Easter in you and make you whole. What a difference that makes in the way we live our lives. Basil Pennington, Roman Catholic priest, expresses that in a way I think that's helpful. He was at a retreat, an interfaith retreat. He was sitting next to a Zen Buddhist master. And the Zen master turned to him laughing and said, I like Christianity. And and you know what I like most about it? I like resurrection. And then he looked at him and he said, let me see your resurrection. Let me see your resurrection. What an interesting sentence, huh? Basil Pennington knew what he meant. He meant, let me see evidence of it in your life. Let me see him Easter in you. Let me see something different. Let me see your hope. Let me see your joy. Let me see your confidence, your trust your peace. Let me see your resurrection. It's my prayer for you and for me as we go from this place that people would see that that Christ Easter's in us. They would see in us evidence of our faith in new life and resurrection. The writer of Colossians speaks of getting new clothes Not those itchy Easter clothes. But he says, he uses a wonderful image. He says, we we take off the old, we set aside the old, and we put on some new things like compassion and kindness and love and forgiveness. These are the clothes that we wear as Easter people. It's a powerful image for his first hearers. Because they were baptized into the church on Easter Sunday. Almost everybody was in the early church. And when they were baptized, they got new clothes. A brand new white robe. Pure white robe. As a symbol of their new life. May we go from this place today. As people in whom Christ is Eastering. Amen. O loving and gracious God, we gather here as your children, your grateful children. 
And we come to say thank you for the gift of this day, for the gift of life, and for the opportunity to worship together. Not just those of us who worship in this place, but all who worship in all sacred places today. They are our sisters and our brothers, and we are better because of them. The sacred places of our lives extend in so many different places and ways. Tonight in Houston, in a place that many would say is sacred, a baseball field, the Rangers and the Astros will begin something that is new, something that is new and alive and different, a new season, new hope, the evidence of work and the evidence of moving toward the future. Life is truly much more than baseball, but it is a reminder to us that new life springs forth in oh so many ways with oh so much joy and with, oh, so much expectation. We thank you, O God, for the new beginnings of Easter. We thank you for your presence in Jesus, your presence on the cross, and for the tomb that is truly empty. As we leave this place today, this sacred place, may we show the world our resurrections with clear minds and with open hearts and in the name of Christ, who teaches us now to pray as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory of the earth. I hope you will notice that our closing hymn is printed in your bulletin, All Creatures of Our God and King. I also hope you will notice that there is a guy sitting in the second row of our center section uh, whose name is Dr. Lamar Smith. You'll recognize him because he's the one in the robe and the stole. As we sing this closing hymn, as we always do each and every Sunday, we open the doors of our church to you. If this is the day that you would like to embrace the new life offered to you and to all of us in Christ, then Dr. Smith and Dr. Brewster would be honored to welcome you here in the front. If you would come forward as we sing, they will introduce you to the congregation and welcome you into this community. And now, my friends, let us stand and raise our voices to God.
Our gathering will soon be ended. Where will we go and what will we do? May grace, peace, hope, love, and joy forever accompany you. For Christ has risen. risen Amen.